Hello and welcome to our Sectigo webinar, The Bright Future of Email Encryption. I am Tim Callen, Senior Fellow at Sectigo, and I'm joined by Jason Sirocco, CTO of IoT at Sectigo. How are you doing today, Jay? Doing great, Tim. Thank you. Great. So we're going to talk about email encryption, why it matters, how you accomplish it, some of the uh, uh, good developments that are making it better and easier for enterprise to do this. And we're going to give you a nice crisp overview in the next 15 minutes. Are you ready to go, Jay? Yeah, thanks a lot, Tim. Let's go. All right. First of all, let's talk about threats. Email, why, um, why do we care about email in the first place? What, what are the dangers from email? E first of all, you know, email's been around a long time. Uh, I don't know anybody who's not using it. And the bad guys know that. <laughs> right. You know, there's all kinds of systems within your IT environment that have all kinds of protections and security, endpoint solutions, firewalls, you name it. Guess what? You're the soft spot, the human being. Yeah. The human being reads an email. You, you're trained to do a job. And, you know, probably 99 to 100 percent of us also want to be as helpful as possible. And therefore, we respond as human beings to requests that come in through email. Absolutely, this is a, a technique of, of getting things done that is not used not just by your boss, but, but by the bad guys. And so what, what we've seen and what we'll be talking about probably a little bit, little bit more with, within this webinar is things like business email compromise, uh, you know, information theft, the ability to harvest your credentials. So a lot of times, in order to, for a bad guy to have you do something, they merely have to ask in a way that makes you think that yeah. the instructions coming from somewhere legitimate. And I think that's the root of the problem, Tim, is it's essentially identity. Who did the email actually come from? Yeah, there's two, uh, there's two weaknesses here, right? One is what you're talking about, which is the social engineering attack, right? And one of the things that we've learned as our computer systems have gotten more sophisticated and more hardened is that that person that's sitting in front of the keyboard hasn't really fundamentally changed. And so the, the social engineering attack continues to be extremely important and valuable. I send you an email under false pretenses, and I get you to do something that is to to your disadvantage, to my advantage, but to your detriment, uh, whether it's maybe you take action like wire money, or maybe you click on a link that sends you to a phishing site, or maybe you open a file that installs some malware, right? And all of these things are based on tricking that human. The other problem that's associated with is that our email infrastructure, our global ubiquitous email infrastructure has roots that go back to the 1970s. And as such, it is fundamentally less secure, especially from an identity perspective, than many, 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 most of the other systems that we have today. And so that's why email can be sent in the clear and people can read it. That's why from addresses can be spoofed and it can seem to be coming in from somebody it's not really coming in from. It's, it's all based on this real very old, very uh, established and difficult to change paradigm. The email protocol, as you say, Tim, yeah. uh, came from a time that was a far more trusting. There wasn't as much of a need to protect the identity of the sender and the destination uh, as there is now. But it's, it's turning out that, of course, in modern times, this is, this is probably one of the most important developments we need to be able to put into email right now because I don't see email going away anytime soon. Yeah, exactly. So um, let's talk about business. You mentioned business email compromises, of course, is where somebody uh, pretends to be an important person in your business world, like a boss or a supplier or a vendor, and comes into someone in the organization who has the ability to do a wire transfer and basically gets that person tricks that person into transferring money to an account that doesn't really belong to that legitimate partner vendor or, or, or such, but rather belongs to the, the criminal who's tricking you. And business email compromise has been just a, uh, uh, exploding in recent years. Um, and we can see, you can see the numbers as well as I can, but this is one of the, one of the areas where the, the thieves have really learned uh, uh, that spear phishing can work. You know, people have been talking about spear phishing as a concept 
going back probably to the early 2000s, right? Probably the year 2000 or the year 1999. And it was all kind of theoretical for a number of years, but it ain't theoretical anymore. It's happening in a big, big way. Tim, I'll, have, I'll, I'll pause here on this slide for a moment because I, I've read an article very recently that I think applies here. Uh, one of the latest techniques uh, to get money out of organizations, it used to be, you know, for the last little while, a lot of what makes up these numbers are, you know, you get an email from your CFO, your CEO asking uh, an administrator for, hey, buy me a bunch of uh, gift cards, for example, right. and that'll happen, right? So there, therefore, it's just, it's, it's just a, how do you get money into the bad person's hands? Use your imagination. Just about every trick in the book's been used. The, the article that I read just recently kind of uh, really shows how the, even these large numbers are going to continue to grow. Uh, an administrator will receive an email from who's somebody who's purporting to be the CEO saying, hey, can you give me a list uh, of our, our aging accounts? Right. And that's kind of a key word for a lot of financial administrators to go, oh, you want a list of all the companies who owe us money? <laughs> yes, sir, boss, I'll send you that right away. Yeah. Well, imagine if that information gets into the hands of the bad guys. Those are literally, that's literally a list of hot leads of if you can contact those people in the name of the corporation that yeah. is supposed to possess that list, you can then say, hey, you owe me, you know, X number of thousand, X number of, of million dollars. You need to start paying off your, you know, your, your account. And, and they, they just very well may do that. Absolutely. So the bad, yeah, the bad guy essentially acts as a collections agency. I, th I think that technique <laughs> will work, Tim, and it, it's just going to grow these numbers higher and higher. Yeah, and, and you're hitting another important point, which is that some of the email attacks are, are the old brain dead, dead script kitty stuff we all know about, which is, you know, your PayPal account's been suspended, click here. But some of them are very sophisticated, multi-stage. They're operated by people who are very smart and who do their homework and they're looking for big payoffs, right? They're, they're, they're getting, they're, they're trying to get six, seven, eight figure payouts. Um, and sometimes they do. And so that's, uh, you know, there's a lot of investment that's that they're prepared to go into if that's the kind of money that they think they're going to get at the other end. So, so content itself is also a vulnerability. And these are a couple high profile examples of where the damage came just from getting, getting confidential information uh, that was in email that shouldn't have been public. Yeah, absolutely. Sony, you, you might remember the example where uh, even entire movies were exfiltrated out of yeah. Sony that hadn't been released yet. Um, the, I still hear conversations on radio shows and, and when you listen to, into the entertainment industry where mm -hmm. Sony executives, you know, were bad mouthing actors and, and, and all the sniping going back and forth, all of that dirty laundry got completely aired. Yeah. And, and Tim, it's, it, I think you're the one who reminded me just recently that it, it's not often that a CEO gets, you know, gets turfed or, or, or has to resign for, for cyber reasons. But this was a case where it actually happened. Yeah. The CEO lost her job because the secrets that were revealed because Sony's entire email store was stolen and released on WikiLeaks. The, the secrets that were revealed were so damaging that the CEO had to quit, had to resign. Um, and then the Democratic National <laughs> uh, Committee, you know, they, they potentially, arguably, lost the presidential election as a consequence of their email breach. Uh, and, and again, in both of these cases, the problem is email had a lot of, of really important content. That content was unencrypted. It was sitting in the clear. And therefore, if a bad guy could penetrate your server and grab it, which in both of these occasions a bad guy did, then at that point, the bad guy has all of that content because it's not, it's data at rest that is sitting there that is not encrypted. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Yeah, I'm sure John Podesta and others would love a do-over. It's right. really unfortunate what happened there. I, I think in a democratic country, 
Yeah. Uh, that, that was just a worst case scenario. Yeah. Now, who else would like a do over is a few companies that have been whacked by massive GDPR fines. So, you know, another thing that's hot on people's minds right now is how to protect themselves from GDPR. And email is a really important part of that. So, so you know, it's essentially GDPR is a very strong uh, consumer or individual data protection regulation that's pan-European in its nature. And the GDPR guidelines basically state that uh, uh, personal consumer information must be protected at all costs. And if it's not, you can get really hit hard. So fines can be up to 4% of your revenue or 20 million euros, whichever is greater. <laughs> so if you've got 30 million in revenue, you in principle could be hit for 20 million in fines. It's absolutely staggering or 4% of revenue. And, um, uh, and, you know, if you look at some of these fines on the lower right, we'll see. These are just things within the last few months. Google, 50 million euros. Marriott, 99 million pounds. British Airways, this was just in the last couple weeks. 183 million pounds sterling. Massive, massive fines. The British Airways fine was equivalent to 1.5% of their annual revenue. You know, Tim, I, I think what this is showing is that GDPR has teeth. I yes. think a lot of people wondered whether or not GDPR would be enacted and whether the, the fines would come through, what the sizes would be. Right. I think we're starting to see the answers now. Uh, I, I don't think anybody doubted that Europe, you know, using GDPR might go after some of the big social media outlets such as Google, you know, Facebook, some of the others. I, I think we've seen that. But when you start to see Marriott and British Airways, you're starting to see large enterprises also take it yeah. in the shin. And right. I, don't, I don't think it'll be long before, you know, measured uh, fines against some organizations that aren't quite as large will start to happen as well. Therefore, I think everybody, everybody, yeah. uh, and it doesn't matter how much business you think you're doing in Europe. I, I think if you're of any size uh, of a business at all, you need to be thinking about this. Yeah, and there have been, to be clear, these are some of the ones that make the headline, but there have been hundreds and hundreds of companies have been have received GDPR fines so far. So, yeah. so you bet. It's not like you can say, well, I'm small, I'm under the radar, this isn't going to happen to me. Um, and, and, you know, to your point, Jason, you know, Google Marriott, these aren't even European countries, <laughs> or companies, rather, excuse me. So, you know, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be located in Europe, you just have to be doing business in Europe to be at risk. Now, how does email protection enter into this? Well, there's a couple ways, and we're gonna get into the details of this on the next slide. But first of all, is you can just plan reduce your likelihood of breach by giving, by encrypting email in transit, by uh, offering people the ability to determine the true source of an email, you can actually mitigate these attacks. You make them harder, you make them less likely to happen, and you can actually reduce the likelihood that a breach occurs in the first place. Uh, but in addition to that, part of what's built into GDPR as a concept is that the scale of the fine will be appropriate to the level of negligence of the enterprise. So, and they've and and the regulators have been very upfront on this point, which is if you try to do everything right and you're con and you're just you're you're following every best practice that is known to people and you get breached anyway, then yeah, you'll be fine, but you should expect that to be smaller than if you're cutting corners or not trying or showing that you don't really care. And so this is an important step that enterprises can take and it can help show that they really care and it can help them go down and demonstrate that they did everything that was in their best power. And then even if you do get breached, hopefully that fine is, is less draconian than it would be otherwise. Yeah. Systematic lack of due diligence is, is what's going to net you some of the bigger fines. That's absolutely right, Tim. Right. So how, tell us how certificates help. Right. Uh, so it ha helps in a few ways, which is basically, uh, uh, we can go maybe in the order of, that you have here on the slide, but uh, the ability to know where the email actually came from yeah. is huge. Uh, 
Meaning that that old problem we talked about at the beginning of, geez, did this come from my CEO? Did it come from my CFO? Did it come from who it's claiming to be? Because that from address on the email can't really be trusted. Yeah. If you actually, if you actually use an SMIME certificate with the email, what you're able to then say is, the bearer of that certificate is the only person who could have sent me that email and have it look this way. Yes. That's very important. Number two, uh, that exact problem with Sony and the, and the democratic party and a lot of these things we're talking about with GDPR. If, if you have intellectual property, if you have secret information, if you have people's uh, PII personally identifiable information within yeah. emails um, if you can, or, if you, or employee that. PII is another yeah. big one. Employee, employee PII employee is Employee tax huge. records is a huge honeypot and there's a lot of attacks that are aimed at those. Yeah, Tim, let's just, I'm going to step back just for a moment here. I think a lot of people might think, you know, I'm an underdog. I'm a smaller player. I'm a smaller organization. Uh, nobody's going to go after my information. No, your information has value. Yeah. That is the first thing you have to overcome in understanding that encrypting your email is important because there's, there is value within it. And number three, they're also very important. And this, this is one of the original reasons why SMIME certificates originally came out, which is from the source to the destination, that email has not been altered. And that is something right. you can be assured of if, if, that, if a digital certificate has been used on that email. Yeah. And that's important. So you know that you're not getting something that's been modified to, to, again, to trick you or to, to wreak some kind of havoc. So, however, so, so, so SMIME is really great. It does these things. We badly need these things. Email is an essential business communication tool that we can't live without, but it is fraught with danger. So for all these reasons, we would think everybody would be using SMIME certificates, and yet they are not. So what traditionally have been the reasons for that, Jay? The oldest reason, even back, uh, you know, X number of years ago, was just getting uh, an SMIME certificate issued to you. I would say that's low to medium difficulty. You, you can, you know, the, the means of, of asking for one are not difficult. The problem is once you have it in your hands, what do you do with it? And right. even back in the day when if you just used your desktop computer to send emails, how do you how do you install it? Mm-hmm. That was that actually that actually had some fairly technical steps, and for a large organization, it was unscalable, right? So it was it was just difficult to do, and that was probably the main reason why SMIME wasn't picked up outside of you know specialist kind of needs. Right. And once but, upon a time, we did our email on a single machine, so all right. you had to do was get it installed on your desktop computer, and you were done. But, but even now, that was difficult. Yeah, and even that was difficult. But now everybody's walking around with at least one device that's untethered, like a phone or a tablet, or more than one, plus one or more computers. And you need to have the same cert on all of them. And that just takes the difficulty and increases it by a factor of that many devices. That's exactly right, Tim. So and it, it and i think as as you reminded me before as well every one of those devices has to have the same certificate which yeah. is which which means there has to be some kind of management capability to assure that sure exactly so and then so okay so multiple devices talk to us about lost keys right if you've encrypted a bunch of email and you've done exactly what we've said you should do which is to protect your email from breaches what happens if you lose the key well the problem is and, and what right by lost key, what means a, a lost SMIME certificate. Yeah. If you lose that certificate and, and you can no longer retrieve that from anywhere, well, you might be locked out of your emails the same way the bad guy is. And so therefore, that's a really, really bad thing. Therefore, uh, you know, what, what's really needed here is some kind of mechanism to be able to recover those SMIME certificates in an easy way and get those devices reprovisioned. Yeah. And then lastly, secure email gateways. So secure yeah, I email think gateways what you, and these certs don't always play nice together, right? Yeah. And I think really, Tim, you know, what we could have titled that, that bullet point is searching emails. Sure. Because, uh, you know, as if you, if you encrypt email content, 
Yeah. One of the problems is how do you search it? How does a search right. engine, how, how does an email gateway, which is essentially a, a fancy way of saying, you know, yeah. the, the mechanism which is searching through emails, how is it going to search encrypted emails? That's a problem. But yeah. uh, so there, therefore, that's another problem that has to be solved. So, so it was difficult to install. It was difficult to recover from, from, from mistakes and it was difficult to search through emails. I think any one of those three was enough for people to not use S-MIME. Yeah. But all three together made it just untenable. Absolutely. So what do we do about it? We've got to make, we've got to make S-MIME super easy to get onto all your devices. That's what we've yeah. got to do. And that's zero touch installation. So, so the concept behind zero touch, touch installation is that a regular user can basically agree to the, to the email and I'm sorry, agree to using the, the certificate. And then at that point, an automated system can ensure that the certificate is deployed correctly and uniformly across the full set of devices that that person needs to use that email. And you know what, Tim, it's not just zero touch installation. I'll go further. It's zero touch configuration as well. How many of you have ever been given, you know, a three, four, five, six page instruction document <laughs> on, on, on how to set up your Android or iOS device to your corporate Outlook account or, or whatever other account you happen to be using. That is simply a pain in the butt right. and, and that's been solved. And then you do everything it says and it still doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then for the lost keys in the secure email gateways, these are really solved through key vaulting. Yeah, what happens if the key management system, if the certificate management system that you're using uh, is capable of not only keeping your uh, secure SMIME certificate within a secure escrow type environment, but also has the means to reprovision in a zero touch way. This is what we mean by this. And it's, it's a huge leap forward. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it makes, it allows you to, um, you know, first of all, you don't really have that last case scenario, but then secondly, you can integrate automatically with something like your secure email gateway. So it can actually access the content of those emails in a secure way. Um, and without, uh, without compromising the security, if let's say a bad guy comes. So, so when you put all of that together, I think zero touch installation and key vaulting are probably the two key features that can be built into email that can allow us MIME certificates to really be usable in the real world for real enterprises, for those real users. We get the benefits that we talked about on the previous page here authentication, encryption, and unaltering, we solve the, or, or mitigate, at least strongly mitigate the attacks that we talked about before. And all of this can be pragmatic and practical. And that is something that the enterprise should look for. Right, Jay? Yeah. So uh, I, just one last point on this slide. Uh, key vaulting also helps with that searchable email problem. Uh, yes. The secure email gateway because of the fact that if you're able, if the system is able to actually store your, those, those certificates within a vault um, and use it as necessary in a secure way, obviously then not, not only can you recover the email, re recover the certificate to look at your, what could have been a lost email, you could also presumably, and this is where we're going with this, mm -hmm. be able to use that certificate recovery mechanism to also search emails at will. So it's yes. a, it's a huge leap forward and the three main problems with SMIME are now solved. Yes. And even that last point, even after the employee has left the company or even after the certificate has expired, you still yeah. have those legacy emails are still available. And now if I need to get them or I don't know, I get a court order, um, I'm actually able to comply with that. So yes, absolutely. Those are very good. So that's what to look for when you're considering putting SMIME on your enterprise um, uh, email. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and plug our podcast. So if you like this conversation, Jason and I do run a regular podcast. It's called Root Causes. And we do try to get to the root causes of the key drivers in the PKI industry today. It's really focused on the world of PKI and digital certificates. And you can find us on all of these popular podcasting services and more uh you want to add anything that to jay to that to well, that jay i tell you what uh 
even within this this webinar today, uh, I'm I'm quite often tempted to go off in different directions that uh, <laughs> I, I think would be best served from the podcast. I mean, check it out. I think it's really interesting. If you're interested in security at all, if, if you're interested in any of the such subjects we talked about today, uh, I, I think uh, the weekly or bi-weekly podcast we put out are, should be very interesting to you. Yeah, absolutely. It is such a deep and varied subject. There is so much going on in the world of PKI and digital certificates today. It is a cornerstone of all of our digital systems globally, and there is a, a bottomless wealth of interesting, important subjects to be explored. So we'd love to have you join us, the Root Causes Podcast. Go find us on these services. And with that, I want to thank you today, Jay. Thank you, Tim. Okay, and thank you to the listeners. <laughs>